Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host, Phil Lindsay. Classic cop films, all right? Let's talk about them. Classic cop films. This could be from any era. This could be from any decade. Doesn't really matter. And it could be, it doesn't have to be action or, or straight up drama. It can be comedy as well. Cop movies. And look, cop movies most of the time are far better than cops in reality in the real world. But hey, we don't have to go there. It's okay. Uh, we'll just stick to Hollywood because, uh, you know, even their screwed up versions are probably much better than the real versions of some of the stuff happening in your very own city. But hey, I'm not here to soapbox, even though it is my show, I can do what I want. Don't tell me I can't. But uh, buddy cop films. How about that? Let's take a different approach. Buddy cop films. And they don't always have to be action. They can also be comedy. They can be a hybrid of both. 48 Hours uh, uh, springs to mind. That stars a guy we're talking about here today. Lethal Weapon films, that's a good one, right? There's some others out there, some franchise films that bring a lot of people to the table, make a ton of money, man. Yes, these films exist. They can be very fun depending on what franchise it is and, of course, who the stars are. And it doesn't get much bigger depending on what genre you're talking about, what decade you're talking about, than Eddie Murphy. We've covered Eddie Murphy a couple times here on the show, so this is not the first time we're talking about him. But today we're talking about Beverly Hills Cop. Talk about a classic cop film, man. A classic cop action slash comedy film. And man, have I got thoughts on this here classic freaking film that made some scratch. I'm talking a lot. When I tell you, it'll blow your mind, so prepare yourself. Let's get into it, shall we? Beverly Hills Cop is a 1984 American buddy cop action comedy film. If you've been paying attention, directed by Martin Brest, screenplay by Daniel Petrie Jr., story by Danilo Bach and Daniel Petrie Jr., and starring Eddie Murphy, as we said, along with some other great actors in some really cool roles. This film, produced by Dom Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, if you know anything about 80s action and 90s as well, then you know the combination of those two names for sure. This film was released in the United States, December 5th, 1984. Running time, 105 minutes. The budget for this film, I saved it to last because it's fun. The budget for this film is $13 million. Sit down to something and hold on. The box office is $316 million. Dude, what? And that is your lowdown? For Beverly Hills Cop. Phil, I straight up haven't seen this movie in years, and man, have I got some thoughts. But I'm going to let you start us off. What did you think about the film after how long it's been since you've seen it, and how long has it been since you've seen it? I mean, I haven't seen the original Beverly Hills Cop in years. Um, you know, this kind of goes when there's a franchise uh, and the movies are on cable a lot. They're on like regular, like TV, like TBS, TNT. They usually show the last movie of the franchise a lot. So I've seen Beverly Hills cop three more than any of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and Beverly Hills cop was made before I was born. So (laughs) I didn't, I didn't see it, um, when it came out, but those three years, um, from what 82 to 85 or something like that those were the years that really made eddie murphy into a star those are the the years that proved that he was a box office draw um whether it be 48 hours and that was like his breakout and then trading places of course but um beverly hills cop was different because as you said this was the one that showed this guy is a box office draw people will come out and spend money to see him Oh, man, this is Eddie Murphy in his prime. This is Eddie Murphy doing wonderful things. I got to tell you, man, 1984, dude, I bumped into absolutely nothing on this movie. This movie's not hokey. 
there's no cringe moments for me. There's no moments that don't feel right in terms of the pacing. There's silly comedy bits, but that's in a lot of his movies. Yes. Dude, I legitimately bumped into nothing. You could release this film today as is, and I think it works. I know it works. I honestly didn't bump into anything here. Did you bump into anything at all that doesn't hold up well for you? I, it wasn't that I bumped into it. It's just once I saw it, I'm just like, oh, yeah, he is in this movie. Uh, Damon Wayans as the um, <laughs> ambiguously gay uh, server at that like gives him the bananas. Yes. And this is this is before Damon becomes like Damon that we know that's like bald. He's still like holding on to a little bit of hair up there. I didn't realize how much he looked like Kane until I saw him with hair. Yes. My God. Yes. Um, I had no clue. No, I didn't bump into it. But when I watched that, I was just like, oh yeah, that's right. He was in here in this brief cameo. Yeah. That was awesome. That was awesome. So glad to... <laughs> it was the uh it was the uh, the the film critic from uh, what is it? Men on film from uh, uh, Living Color in Living Color. Yes. So yeah, great character, man. I always love those guys. Him and David Allen Greer <laughs> hated it. Yeah. Hey. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was uh, uh when I initially saw uh, Batman versus Superman. That was what I posted on social media at the time. I posted a picture of them with just hated it. <laughs> that's great oh man off topic remember the the bit where um he got hit in the head with like a falling stage light and it turned him straight yes. and, and his he, voice changed he's all macho man yes. get off me <laughs> yes it, it it doesn't um david <laughs> allen greer fix it by bonking him on the head i think so yeah oh god that's funny that's insanely funny <laughs> yeah, that is a funny one. Now I'm thinking about it because like, he goes to say hated it. He said it in a regular voice, loved it. Oh God, yeah, so good. This will become another show altogether if we're not careful. We'll just talk about it in living color the whole time. Yeah, it it. This is such a good film, dude. I, I, it's hard to know where to start. Like again, whenever we review something that's multiple years old, I kind of brace myself and wait for moments to pop up. I swear to you, there's no, I, there's absolutely nothing for me that pops up. Like it's. It's straight up a really, really good flick that I don't bump into at all. It's crazy, man. Like, I, I remembered in my head Eddie's performance was higher, like more up-tempo, and it's totally not. It's low-key. It's chill through the whole film. He's laid back. And, like, he's not the comic relief at all. There's not really even really any comic relief. It's pretty much a straightforward film, and the comedy just comes here and there. Man, this movie is freaking great. And I say it as though I didn't know that. I knew it was a classic. But like you said, you know, years go by. And then plus two and three happen. And then you kind of remember how good the original is. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen it. So this really, after Saturday Night Live, this is what really, I believe, put him on the map. Wasn't this his first hit after Saturday Night Live, I believe? Or was it 48 Hours? Uh, I believe 48 Hours is, is like his first official hit because yeah. that was like his breakout role in film. Um, and I mean, that movie did pretty well. Trading Places did pretty well. But um, again, when you're talking about like box office, like which one made the most money? It's Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. I mean, it's... Dude, listen to this. 82, 48 Hours. 83, Trading Places. 84, Beverly Hills Cop. 86, The Golden Child. 87, Beverly Hills Cop 2, 87, Eddie Murphy Raw, 88, Coming to America, 89, Harlem Nights, 90, Another 48 Hours, 92, Boomerang, 94, Beverly Hills Cop 3, 95, Vampire in Brooklyn, 96, 90, Professor. He could have retired right. after that. Can, dude, all in a row, consecutive years in a row, that's insane. What a run. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Golden, Golden Child is very underrated in my opinion. Very 100% funny. agree. Yeah. Yeah, what a run. Like you said, a man, he's in, he looks like Eddie Murphy in this movie. I know that sounds weird, but in my head, Eddie Murphy's the young guy from Saturday Night Live. Whenever I think of him, I think of that guy. I don't necessarily think of older Eddie Murphy, you know, with with his head shaved. I just don't picture that guy. This is the Eddie Murphy I think of. The Eddie Murphy from Trading Places is the Eddie Murphy I think of. A skinnier Eddie Murphy with like more hair and like his uh, mannerisms and everything are very toned down. Very toned down. He is nowhere near being over the top here, man. 
yeah, he's he's not quite as um animated and everything as he is um and some of the other things we see him in. And not to say that that stuff is bad, but right. um Eddie Murphy in the early eighties is just different. There's a cool factor to him in the early eighties that's just different. You're right. You're right. It's a, it's a different frame of reference, a different vibe, really. It yeah. really truly is a different vibe. Yeah. There's some tropes in this film, but can I be honest with you? I I don't think any of them are deal breakers. I expect tropes from comedy cop films. I really do. Like, and even the tropes that are here, I don't go, oh, come on. Like, you know, Eddie's got his what what do they call him inspector, I think. It's not even lieutenant, is it? It's just I don't even bump into that because we don't see him, but maybe t- I think twice, maybe once or twice. Uh, yeah. And that's it. We don't see him again. We only hear that he's upset with Eddie and everything, but like, man, yeah, again, I, I just don't bump in anything here. Let's talk about the plot a bit before we get into the cast. The plot is pretty simple. Eddie is Axel Foley, best name ever. Still a great name. He's Axel Foley. Yeah, right, right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, some of the bit parts in here, we'll get to Bronson Pinchot, but I love that dude, by the way. If you know 80s TV, you know Bronson Pinchot, because he was... Big Balky. Yes, Balky, absolutely. Perfect Strangers. I love that freaking show, man. Oh, such a good show. Remember the Balky dance? Oh, my God, it was awesome. (laughs) So good, so good. Uh, Axel Foley, basically, he's, he's a cop in Detroit. And a buddy of his comes, his hands, he gets out of prison. He's been out for six months and, and, uh, and Axel doesn't know this. Axel is one of those cops that just kind of does things his way. Of course he is. Who else would he be? And when his friend gets murdered, he's off to Beverly Hills tracking down clues. And that's where we get the Beverly Hills cop part of this film. Um, I don't bump into the plot at all. Uh, the fact that they just let him walk into that town and never ship him off. They never truly arrest him and really, cause you know, it's cops talking to cops. So what are they really going to do? All that stuff can be a bit wacky if you want to overthink it, which I don't, but yeah, Eddie Murphy's in his prime. He looks great. He sounds great. He's low key, but it works. Everything works here. Such a good flick. Is this, I don't know what you think. What, what for you, what is his best film? Is it this or no? Mm. It's probably coming to America for me. Hmm. It's probably coming to America. And he was not exactly low key in that. He was very low key in Harlem Nights, however. Yeah, I mean, coming to America, he pretty much plays the straight man to all of his characters that mm-hmm. he uh, does the makeup for, he does the cameos for. And then um, Arsenio Hall is there to be, you know, the funnier person out of the two of them. Um, but yeah, no, coming to America, I don't care how many times I watch it, it just never gets old. Um, yeah. He in this movie does so many things that are funnier the, the funnier the first time you see it and every time you see it like after a long time it's like <laughs> like like him getting thrown out of that window. <laughs> I don't care how many times I see it. It's just the way they threw him out the window and then and then the police car immediately pops up and he's just like, Wait a minute, why am I being arrested? I got thrown yeah. out the window. <laughs> He can't let that go either. He goes on and on and on about that through several scenes of this film. Yeah, cause he's just like, wait a minute. I, he was like, what am I getting arrested for? Being thrown out a window? <laughs> hey, look, not for nothing. Not for nothing here, man. But honest to God, like, why would you have thrown him out the window of your building? Like, that is kind of odd, I have to say. That never made any sense to me at all. I, yeah, I just think the way they do it, it did it is so funny. Just five for five or six guys to just pick this guy up and throw him out the front window. And then like I said, the police car immediately pulls up. <laughs> they they don't look at the window, don't watch these other guys walking away or nothing. They immediately grab him. <laughs> yeah, immediately. <laughs> very, very funny. Hey, don't even ask questions. It's freaking nuts. I don't get that at all. Yeah, no. And he doesn't even tell them who he is either. No. Yeah, it, but it's just so many things he does. Um, the one-liners he has in this movie, um, things that he's doing or uh, <laughs> things that he's doing during scenes that just makes it so absurd. When he's in a strip club and they're in there talking and um, the entire time he's talking to them, he's like gyrating in a seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you in tune with the music yeah oh that's really good yeah um well let's see let's talk about 
some of the rest of this cast here, man. Judge Reinhold as Billy. If you know anything about 80s films, you know Judge Reinhold. I can't say Judge Reinhold was part of the Brat Pack. It always kind of felt like he was satellite to that group. Like he was there, but it, I don't know. I never really grouped him in with that that group of kids. Did you? I mean, to me, he was always kind of just on the exterior of that of that group of actors. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't bunch him in there. And, and funny enough, every time I think about him, I think of him as uh the other guy in santa claus that yeah <laughs> yeah well, i think of him i think of him in santa claus in his uh oscar minor oscar meyer wiener whistle that's right he and carrie uh it was at carrie yules uh both have sort of that lame white guy aesthetic to but to them like yes. uh carrie and true lies kind of the same or not true lies but uh liar liar kind of the same way man i love judge reinhold i actually think he's underrated as we get into this, we haven't mentioned this at all, Phil, but they're working on the next film, Beverly Hills Cop 4, and they're bringing back the original cast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not sure I know how to feel about that. I guess it all depends on how they they deem fit to wrap up the franchise and put a, a you know, put a, a punctuation mark on the story. I don't know. I'm curious to see. Yeah. The thing with, the thing with Beverly Hills Cop, and I think – not to say the sequels are bad, uh, but Beverly Hills Cop is so 80s. Like, everything about it is 80s. And so it's hard to kind of take it out of that time period and have the same vibe to it. You know what I mean? Because, like I said, yeah. everything about this movie, the way he dresses, the way people in this movie dress, uh, the soundtrack is very 80s. Um, the 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 a- Axel F that plays throughout the movie that is like the main theme for the movie is extremely eighties. Yes. Um. The uh, Patty Labelle record that plays in it, uh, uh stir it up, eighties <laughs> to a T. Um, yeah. There's another there's another like big eighties hit that plays throughout this movie too, and it's just like boy, this couldn't feel like it's any more of like a time capsule movie. A Neutron Dance, like <laughs> it, it, it get more eighties than Neutron Dance. Oh man, the Pointer Sisters, hundred percent. Yeah, this soundtrack was uh, actually nominated for, and I think the soundtrack won a Grammy, I believe. It did. It did win a Grammy for Best Soundtrack. Yeah, uh, the the bit where he's walking up the street and the two guys are wearing uh, Michael Jackson outfits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he just got that laugh. Yeah, uh, I mean, when he shows up to the hotel and he's he's telling them he's a writer for Rolling Stones and he dropped name drops Michael Jackson. Yeah, because Michael yeah. Jackson at that time was the biggest star in the world. No doubt about it. Uh, don't you love how uh, everyone at the hotel just immediately gave him a room and fell for it and never questioned him and didn't have him escorted out of the building? Like they were, they were okay to give this guy they'd never met before because he claimed to be a reporter for Rolling Stone. Just gave him a room. Well, the funny thing about it is when you tie it to the way he was making a fuss at all these places and he immediately would, would, would throw his race card out. <laughs> and coming from where he's from, Detroit is Detroit. And, you know, it's a more gritty city. It's a more violent city. Um, California is a more liberal, um, progressive in some way, way state. It has that, uh, has that reputation about it. And so you're also coming out of a time period where... Um, Police brutality was becoming a bigger thing in in the world at in, in the world view, um, and so even when you look at the stuff like him getting punched by the police officer, and somebody immediately comes out and makes him apologize, right? It's, it's just like yeah, he might not have gotten away with that if people weren't so touchy and uncomfortable about race. Yeah, that's fair. Because his whole argument about being a writer for uh. Rolling Stones and how he like immediately throws out that word and he's just like, are you going to just throw me out here? Cause I'm black basically. And then the manager comes around and fixes it right away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't have this. We can't have this guy out here saying this stuff. Yeah. He's like loud and, and throwing a, a scene. Yeah. Very funny. But yeah. Yeah, it, it does speak to like the uh, atmosphere around race at that time period as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. We got to mention Judge Reinhold's partner, John Ashton, as Sergeant John Taggart. John Ashton looks like a cop in an yes. 80s film. 100%. He could have been on Law & Order. He would have fit right in. This guy just looks like a cop. 
Some guys just look like cops, man, or at least TV and movie versions of what we think cops should look like. But I think he and Reinhold are perfectly cast here. I honestly, I think they're both great. Uh, they brought, they were in part two and three, weren't they? Or were they? Yes. Yeah, two yeah. and three. They're both in uh, uh, part four as well. Yeah. John Ashen is 75 now. Ooh. Wow. So yeah, they're both going to be in part four. So interesting to see how that works. But I think they're great here, man. And and look, still, to the point of John Ashton is is the veteran cop who doesn't take he's, he's no nonsense. And then Judge Reinhold is a younger cop who's kind of more trusting and willing to take a chance and wants to believe Axel. And I'm telling you, even that doesn't feel weird. Two Nations Under Ted, a Ted Lasso podcast, tackles one of the most popular and critically acclaimed series of our time, bringing together three hosts from two different parts of the world. Two Nations reviews all three seasons of Ted Lasso, 34 episodes total with wrap-up episodes coming at the end of each season. Follow the show on social media at Two Nations Pod, and be sure to subscribe and download on all the major platforms. Just look us up, Two Nations Podcast. I've seen so many movies with a plot like this that just does not you're like god oh, this is so cliche i just don't get that man maybe it's just the maybe i'm in a certain mood today when i watched it or i don't know but i don't think these two guys are caricatures at all do, do they hit you that way at all uh i mean just because we've seen so many cop movies since uh 84 mm-hmm. when this came out um it doesn't feel necessarily new anymore because we've seen this where the, the one the one cop that goes against the rules gets the other cops to eventually start siding with him and become buddies. Like this one, the one unruly cop gets everybody else in trouble. And then eventually like they just grow to like him and start doing things his way. Um, That's definitely a cop movie trope. We've seen it Mm -hmm. constantly. Um, And they have no real reason to like this guy. He embarrasses them several times. No kidding, man. Yeah. But, you know, he they grow to like him. And I that's one of the fun things about this movie. Uh, when they try to send the other two cops after him, after he <laughs> after he does the whole banana in the tailpipe um, or and sends them to room service, and then they come after him and the, the, the other black cop comes out and he's like, we're, we're not going to fall for the banana in the pal- tailpipe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he just lets them follow him to the guy's house. He's not even affected by it at all. Yeah, I, again, I just I don't bump into either guy. I, I think they're great here. Um, we've also got uh, Lisa Lisa Elbacher as Jeanette, uh, Jenny Summers, who is an old friend of Axel's. I think she's perfectly fine here. She didn't knock me out, but she also didn't feel over the top. I just love how the low-keyed appearances in this film are low keyed in the best possible way. Like she could have been the damsel in distress. She could have hammed it up and none of that happened, dude. She actually felt like a real person to me. Like I was perfectly fine with her. I don't think I'm familiar with her from anything else. And she's got, dude, she's got some great, man. She's got a lot of credits on her, on her resume. She was an officer and a gentleman. Never say die. Um, the last samurai she's done a lot of tv a lot of tv so she's been around for a while what did you think of her here did you do you recognize her from anything else because i i'm telling you i don't uh not really um i think she's a good uh i think she's a good supporting character here um she doesn't really <laughs> it's, it's funny she doesn't react to any of like the wild stuff that Axel is doing. She's just kind of like, what are you doing, Axel? And then she just goes along with it. She just kind of giggles while he's doing it. It's just funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think she's fine here. I don't bump into anything at all. Yeah. Uh, I got I got to skip down to Bronson Pinchot because I got to talk about him. Man. That bit in the gallery when he's standing there and Axel's talking to him, he's like, get the F out. And he's and he's he does that high pitch thing, and Bronson matches him for the high pitch reaction. No, I cannot, I cannot, because he tells him how much the art's worth. <laughs> Man, that scene alone, that guy should be paid well because that scene alone was freaking hysterical to me. Yeah, uh, no, the way where he kept saying, uh, "What does this pertain to?" Yeah, he's just like, "What pertain?" <laughs> 
I love that you don't really know what nationality he's supposed to be. It's so vague. Yeah. <laughs> just just European. That's it. Sure. Just European. Or it, yeah, the way that they both keep mispronouncing each other's names, he's just like, Aquel. He's like, uh, yeah, thanks, Serge. He's like, Serge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Serge. Yeah, because you see on the credits, it's S-E-R-G-E, and he doesn't pronounce his name at all like that. Like <laughs> Serge. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny. Well, doesn't he call it out in Beverly Hills Cop 3 where he uh, he keeps calling him Serge and he's like, why Why do you insist on pronouncing my name like that? Serge <laughs> sounds like some off-brand uh, uh, washing detergent. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. That's a great line. You're right. He's just basically European. He's like what, what we all think Europeans sound like. And like all Europeans think that all Americans sound like me. You know what I mean? Like country and whatever i mean that honestly that's what they think so we think they sound like that and they think that you know we all sound like ted lasso or something i guess so i love him man this guy i'm telling you perfect strangers as a kid that was one of my favorite shows man such a talented guy and dude you talk about man have you seen his credits his filmography is not bad either risky business in 83 was his debut Beverly Hills Cop, Flamingo Kid. He was in Beverly Hills Cop 3, but not Part 2. First Wives Club. He's done several things that were kind of uh, high profile for sure. Yeah, I love that guy. I got to find some perfect strangers, man. I'm su- I'm impressed that you knew that show. How would you know that show? Yeah, it was uh, part of the TGIF lineup. Oh, ah, there you go. Yeah, that show... From 86 to 93, that thing was on the air for seven years. 150 episodes even. And then it led to a spinoff called Balky that didn't go anywhere. Yeah, I don't know if I remember the spinoff. No, I don't know that I do either. He did things after that, but um, it was never... He never quite caught fire. Man, he always did he do some things, brother. He started in 85. His most recent credit was in 2022, and he's acted basically every year. He has a he has a TV credit for every year since 85. Yeah. That's uh, impressive. Wasn't he on another one of those TGIF shows? Uh, he wasn't playing Balky, though. Um, playing like another kind of like foreign character guy. Uh, step by step. He was on Step by Step as well. Oh, interesting. Step by step. Yeah. Jean-Luc Repura. Yeah. 24 episodes of that show he was on. Good call. I'd forgotten that show as well. Come on, man. TJF. I'm telling you. Yeah, he's very much he's very much a uh very much a TV guy. Nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I think he's great here, honestly. We don't see a whole whole lot of him, but it's worth it whatever time we get to see him. Steven Burkoff as Victor Maitland. He's the heavy here. This guy just looks like a bad dude. He's actually an English actor, author, playwright, theater practitioner, and theater director. He's still with us. He's 86 years old. It'd be great to... Well, no, you can't really see him because he's dead. I mean, not dead, but you know, his character's dead. Because, man, when they shoot him, Phil, they flat out shoot him. This guy, ain't, he ain't getting back up. There's no, no. comeback for this guy, man. <laughs> no, he's, he's definitely not coming back. Woo. I didn't count the number of shots, but I'm sure it was like pushing ten. I think. Yeah, he yeah. just looks like he just looks like a bad guy. The second you nice. see him, he just looks like yeah, this is this is a guy that's up to no good. <laughs> Dude, his filmography, my God, he started actually in 1958, and his filmography, his most recent credit was 2022. Wow. Yep, done a ton of television. He started his television career in '59. Most recent credit was 2020. Man, I'm seeing a trend here, Phil. My goodness. I was forgot I forgot he was in Clock, uh, Clockwork Orange. That's a messed up flick. Don't think I'm ever going to do that on the 6M. But yeah, he's he looks like he could be a villain from the uh, Lethal Weapon flick, any one of those films. You're right. Yeah, he just looks like a bad guy. On the opposite side of that is Ronnie Cox. Ronnie Cox is Lieutenant Andrew Bogomil. Worst last name ever. This guy's been in everything. Started out in 1972 in Deliverance. That's a heck of a way to start your career. And his most recent credit was 2022. Again, Phil, <laughs> acting forever. Yeah. But again, dude, he doesn't even feel like an over-the-top captain in this film. He feels, he's fine. Like, I don't even, 
He's not yelling. He's not screaming. He doesn't get red face. He doesn't do all that, that normal stuff you'd expect. Uh, what did you think about him in this movie? I think he's good. Um, uh, he doesn't do any of the angry chief stuff that Axel's actual boss from Detroit does. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he he looks so stark, and I think it's 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 weird. That even when he's sitting in there, and they're all they're all uh, questioning him, and he's like, "Man, you guys are very polite here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask me if you want to press charges against Taggart. His <laughs> Taggart gut punched him. Let's see, uh, Jonathan Banks as Zach. He is one of the heavies at Victor Maitland's. He's the guy that actually does the shooting and and the guy that Axel throws across the buffet table. You don't even need to know his name, Phil, but once you see his face, you know who the guy is, right? Because he's been in everything. It's, uh, it's Mike from Breaking Bad. It is. And Better and, Call uh, Saul. Better Call Saul. Yeah. He's the, he is the fixer for the big bad in that show. His first credit... Oh, wow. It gets, it, this dude gets his own page, apart from his bio. His first credit is 1978. His most recent credit was 2022. There again, dude. This guy's been around forever. What's cool about him is he can play a villain or he could play a cop, and you would believe either one. He's just got that kind of face, man. He's done some uh, voice work as well. Yeah, his uh, he did a voice in uh, something called Catwoman Hunted, huh? animated film. He was Black Mask. Oh. Yeah, he was in Incredibles 2, did some voice work there. Yeah, Horrible Bosses 2 as a detective. I mean, I'm just barely scraping the service. His television career started in 76. His most recent was 2021. My God, look at all the stuff this guy's done. This is insane. Yeah, another uh, veteran actor here. We've also got James Russo as Axel's bro, as his friend. If you're a cop, Phil, maybe you don't have a friend that spent time in prison. And when he shows up at your house, he's got incriminating evidence on him. And he almost tells him what he's been up to since he got out of prison. <laughs> like, <laughs> dude, you just, you've been out six months, man. Crazy. Can I just say that the way he's killed in this movie is pretty freaking gruesome for a comedy flick? Yes. Ooh. Yeah, that happens a lot, especially like 80s, early 90s movies. Um when it's time to kill the bad guy, they die in a pretty gruesome manner. Like, I mean, in both rush hours, <laughs> the bad guy dies pretty gruesomely. Uh, especially in rush hour two. The guy just falls out of a building, <laughs> lands on top of a cab, and, and lands very harshly. Yeah. Uh, I saw somebody uh, post a montage of the way most of the Disney villains die as well. Yeah, a lot of Disney villains die in very gruesome fashion for a kid's wow. cartoon. <laughs> I don't guess I've ever even thought about that. Makes sense if you think about it. He dies pretty early on, very gruesome fashion. And that's basically who Axel Foley is trying to figure out what's going on. And of course he gets to the, uh, gets to the point, gets to the, the heavy and everything. Paul Reiser is also a cop in Axel's precinct. Again, if you know any eighties or nineties TV, you know, Paul Reiser, Paul Reiser has been around forever. Um, he really had, I don't want to call it a comeback, because he's he's been in several high-profile things over the past few years. Stranger Things is one of them um, that he was in. But I think, I don't know if that put him back in the spotlight or if he was already there. I believe he's done things behind the scenes as well, I think. He started in 1982, and uh, a lot of the stuff on his filmography is pretty impressive. His TV career started in 82 as well. But, uh yeah. I, I knew him from, uh, was it Mad About You? I used to watch that show. He and uh, Helen Hunt were uh, pretty good together, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Never watched this show. Yeah, yeah. It's um, actually, I can't say that Friends spun off of it. I th- think, I can't remember which came first, but Phoebe from Friends, her sister Ursula, her twin sister, was a character on Mad About You. So it had kind of a little, a very small shared universe happening for a little while there. Boy, let me tell you, Mad About You is one of those shows where I heard a few seconds of that theme song coming on and I would immediately change the channel. I don't remember the song. What was the song? Mad About You, baby. (laughs) Yeah, I always cut it off immediately. Like There there are certain songs that as soon as it came on, like I'm like, yeah, get the remote. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, a, a, a one that was like, I mean, immediately turned the channel is um when I was growing up, I watched, of course, watched cartoons mm-hmm. on Saturday. 
And like as soon as cartoons were over, uh, as soon as that little bell rang thing and they started doing the save by the bell thing, I'm like, yep, nice turn. Oh, I hate that. Dude, I will never understand the fascination with Saved by the Bell. I just don't get it. Yeah. Nah, and it, it, it's funny because all of those shows, I know the theme song. Uh, the second I hear it, I'm just like, you yeah, know, like MASH. Yeah, yeah. I know the theme song to MASH immediately. Never seen a single episode of MASH. Dun, 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 dun. And it, the the song's about suicide. Yikes. Yeah, the song's about suicide. I forget the name of it, but like the lyrics and everything. That's why they don't play the lyrics on TV because it makes you want to, you know. Yeah, it's not fun. Oh, that's the Mad About theme I got it playing right now. That's it. Is that song? <laughs> you don't like that? No, it's not even just a theme song. It's just like one of those very white shows. I'm like, yep. <laughs> Frasier too. Frasier. Soon as Frasier starts coming on, yep. Turn. <laughs> At least it's him being funny, Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Jeez. Yeah. I had a, uh, a a girlfriend back in the day, and I think she and I watched every episode of Mad About You. So some of that show is connected back. Like, yeah. That, so, some of my entertainment choices over the years are directly connected to people in my life, which I'm not the only person that does that, I'm sure. A lot of other yeah, people sure. do that as well. So Yeah, I'm sure. Um we, uh, as men, we all know there's some show that you initially don't want to watch that your girlfriend likes, and you mm-hmm. end up watching every episode with her, and so you've seen all the episodes. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it happens a lot. Um, it's just like the joke from uh, from uh, Pulp Fiction. You know, my girlfriend doesn't eat meat, so you know that basically means I don't eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That uh, well, kids, that's basically your your cast. Um, the hotel checkout clerk in the Beverly Hill, the Beverly Palms Hotel, he must be the guy that Axel talks to at the end. That's actually the director. That's Martin Brest. Hmm. Yeah, so he had a very small cameo here. Uh, we we left out Gilbert Hill, who was Inspector Douglas Todd. Uh, Gilbert is no longer with us. Of all these actors who have gotten quite a bit older, he's the one that's no longer with us. You're going to love this guy's backstory. He was actually a politician and a cop. Oh, there you go. Yeah. He was uh, the Wayne County Sheriff's Department in 1957. So then he joined the Detroit... Dude, he joined the Detroit Police Department in 59. Dude, what? In 69, he was promoted to detective and was assigned to the Homicide Division the following year. This is true. Over the next decade, Hill rose to national attention for his ability to obtain confessions out of the most notorious killers... He was involved in the investigation surrounding the Atlanta child murders in 79 that ultimately resulted in the trial and conviction of Wayne Williams. I had no clue. That's why he was so mad. He was like, this isn't jokes, Eddie Murphy. This is serious business. <laughs> Police work in Detroit is serious business. <laughs> <laughs> Cracking wise. I see what you're doing. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. He was, dude. Oh, are you ready for this? Hill was promoted to the rank of inspector in charge of the homicide division by 82 and in 89 retired from the Detroit Police Department at the rank of commander. Yeah, see? Serious business, man. All this joking around. Yeah, I had to go back to be sure I wasn't reading the 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 bio of the character. This is the actual guy. That is insane. We're following his retirement from police work, he became a, pol- a councilman for Detroit, becoming its president in 97 and running unsuccessfully for mayor in 2001. He was initially considered to be the leading candidate and had support for many people connected with incumbent Mayor Dennis Archer. Already a prominent figure in law enforcement, Hill appeared in the Beverly Hills Cop films, playing the role of Inspector Todd, the boss of Eddie Murphy's character, Axel Foley. Offered acting work after the film's release, Hill declined to pursue acting as a career, but did appear in the two subsequent sequels of the movie, saying that the only difference between his famous character's life and his own was that he did not curse as much in real life. That's a great story. <laughs> Did not know that. I dude, the things you learn when you when you start diving on these these movies and these these uh, shows, man, that's awesome stuff. Really, really good. Well, there's your uh, there's your cast, kids. Dude, do you think that anyone could have realized at the time what a monster hit this was going to become, and the fact that it was going to spawn two sequels? I mean, I don't think I saw that coming at all, man. What do you think about this this franchise essentially? you know, not really putting him on the map, but this, these, these three films, this one in particular really did establish him as a leading man in Hollywood. Did it not? Yeah. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anybody believed that it would be as big as it was. Because, I mean, he did do other movies before that. But this is by far up to that point the biggest movie he had been a part of. And I would actually argue that when you look at all of his, like, movie characters, him wearing that Detroit Lions Letterman jacket, it's just synonymous with Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. So this began basically in 77, if you can believe it went back that far. Paramount executive Don Simpson came up with a movie idea about a cop from East L.A. who transferred to Beverly Hills. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. Screenwriter Danilo Bach was called in to rewrite the screenplay. Bach pitched his idea to Simpson and Paramount 81 under the name Beverly Drive about a cop from Pittsburgh named Ellie Axel. However, his... <laughs> yeah, I know, right? However, his script was a straight action film and Bach was forced to make changes to the script, but after a few attempts, the project went stale. With the success of Flashdance, Simpson saw the Beverly Hills film as his next big project. And then it just went on from there. You'll never guess who was initially offered the role of Axel Foley was Mickey Rourke. That's a much different movie. Yes, it is. <laughs> who signed a $400,000 holding contract to do the film. When revisions and other preparations took longer than expected, Rourke left the project to do another film. Martin Scorsese was offered to direct this movie, but turned it down as he felt the film's concept was too similar to Coogan's Bluff. Dude, yeah. Hollywood is a weird place sometimes. Very different movie with Martin Scorsese at the helm, too. Oh, if you think that's something, check this. Sylvester Stallone was originally considered for the part of Foley. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> Stallone gave the script a dramatic rewrite, removing all the story's humor and turning Beverly Hills Cop back into a standard action flick. In one of the previous drafts written for Stallone, the character of Billy Rosewood was called Siddons and was killed off halfway through the script during one of the action scenes. Stallone renamed the lead character to Axel Corbretti with the character of Michael... <laughs> Corbretti, yeah. The character of Michael Tandino being his brother and Jimmy Summers playing his love interest. Stallone has said that his script for Beverly Hills Cop would have looked like the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan on the beaches of Normandy. What? Uh, that sounds awful. Believe <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> I know, right? Jesus. That Believe it or not, the, the finale was me in a stolen Lamborghini playing chicken with an oncoming freight train being driven by the ultra slimy bad guy. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, it's funny to think about that now and he's done several buddy cop movies that ended up being like comedy since then tango and cash is the first one that jumps to mind yeah and by the way can we all just stop piling hate on tango and cash not like this a hot button topic anymore feel the way i just made it sound that is not a terrible movie dude no he's definitely had worse movies yeah. On, on the list of bad Stallone movies, I, I don't think it's as bad. It's nowhere near as bad as Rhinestone. <laughs> Rhinestone's no. by far one of the worst movies ever made. Um, and, and then speaking of like his bad cop comedy movies, Throw Mama from a Train is far worse. Uh, you're thinking of something else. Throw Mama from the Train was Billy Crystal and Dan DeVito. Ah. Uh, don't Stop My Mom Will Shoot. That's what it is. Don't Stop My Mom Will Shoot. Bad movie. <laughs> really bad. It's got a stale Getty from Golden Girls, but still, yeah. It's such a bad movie. Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, have you seen The Samaritan, his his stab at comic book films? I have not. It is just to the left of having a, enough of a budget to look good, if that makes sense. Like, there are moments in that film where you're like, man, if you, all you need is some editing software and some AI stuff, and you can make this movie. That's not to say that it was, you know, intentionally made like that or whatever. I just feel like it was just to the left of having enough of a budget to be a huge film. It's not great, in my opinion. He's, I just think he's good. I just think he's good. But like uh, the movie itself is, eh, you know, there's, there's moments that's worth it, but some of it, eh. There's a twist 
Uh, you're a comic book guy. If you ever watch it, you'll figure the twist out fairly quickly. I had it figured out, but yeah, not a bad flick. Um, yeah, Stallone has had a lot of very bad movies, man. Yes. yes. So you really think about all of the bad movies he's been in. Um, he's been in enough movies that they're so bad that they end up being funny or they end up being hysterically bad. My favorite Bad Stallone movie is Over the Top by far. Oh, such a bad movie. <laughs> it's so terrible, but it's so funny. <laughs> it's so funny. It's one of those things that I, I watch it just to laugh at how bad it is. Though. The, the <laughs> It's just so many things in there that I laugh at all the time, like him, him driving the uh driving this massive truck, and he's like doing the exercise machine while he's driving. God, <laughs> he's only working one arm because it's because it's his arm that he uses. <laughs> it's an arm wrestling move. What do you want here, Phil? He's got to keep that arm primed and ready to go. You know it's on when he turns the hat backwards. And yes. He does that move with his hand where he takes it and, and goes over your thumb between his fingers. Oh, man. Over the top, man. Oh, what a man. what a terrible movie, man. <laughs> that could only have been made in that time period. And he lets the kid drive the, the rig. Remember that? Yes. Oh, my um, God. Isn't, doesn't he get in the arm wrestling competition to win another rig? I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. That money. <laughs> It's not money, so that he has to, doesn't have to drive a truck anymore. No, it's just another rig. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't don't worry about getting off the road and getting out of this life that's wholly dangerous. Let's just get another truck. <laughs> that's a good point. By the way, if Cabretti sounded familiar to you, it should because he took a lot of the ideas for this Beverly Hills Cop flick that he did make and turned it into Cobra. Yes. You know what the best thing about Cobra is? The freaking picture. The 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 poster. That yes. poster, that poster is a work of art. That poster is beautiful. The movie's not good. Again, Stallone. Stallone has had a lot of bad movies, man. Yeah. But, you know, still one of the greatest action stars of all time, man. Can't take anything away from him. Oh, no, of course not. So, to round it out, Besides Stallone and Rourke, other actors who were considered for the role of Axel Foley included James Caan, Al Pacino, and Richard Pryor. Yeah, uh, this franchise is very different with any of those men. No kidding. I I just don't think any of them could have made this movie what it was. It wouldn't have turned into the franchise that it was. Harrison Ford was offered the role but turned it down. How do you like that? Yeah, I don't think he... That's another one where it's just a different movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. It, I mean, there's so many great classic moments in this movie. When he sneaks up on them in the car and pops in the back seat and does that laugh and scares them, that moment it, that moment alone has been replayed a, f- a million times over the years. Yeah, him, him, him cheesing and doing the big okay in the strip club. Yes, that for sure. Yeah, yeah. God, this movie is such a classic, man. Yeah, uh, with vanity playing in the background. That was vanity. Absolutely. Good catch. Vanity, a, a prince discovery uh, who led Vanity Six, which was an all girl group, and there was three of them. Yes. Rest in peace to Vanity. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did definitely catch that. Dude, there's just, this is a great film. I, I, I mean, you know, it, it's just so good. There's just so many great moments in it. I mean, there's, you know, there's moments with 48 hours where it kind of feels like, well, let, let's just get raw. Let's just get, let's just do it. Go for the throat, throw caution to the wind. Let's just effing do this. Let's just rip a hole in it. And that's fine. But like this movie didn't go that route. This movie backed way up off of that and made it a very subtle comedy. And I think that's why it works, man. I think the tone of this movie is perfect, actually. Yes. Um, Eddie Murphy is very good at taking v- something that is kind of a very dark subject matter and making it funny. When you really think about the idea of life, somebody getting thrown in jail for life or something they did not do, it's not funny at all. It's actually yeah. horrible, but he <laughs> has to make this funny movie out of this scenario. And I think this is kind of the same thing where when you really think of the concept of this movie that his friend gets out of jail and then gets murdered 
uh, pretty brutally, and he has to go to L.A. and uh, kind of solve this mystery. Kind of a dark premise, but <laughs> it ends up being a really fun movie. God, it so does. Yeah. He, you know, I don't know what, I'm, I'm not real sure I understand what happened with his film career at some point. I've never, I've never dove enough on him as an, as an, an overall actor to understand, you know, like the, when I ran down his string of hits from 82 to 96, I mean, that's 14 years, mm-hmm. but you see what he followed up with. 98 was Mulan. Yes. Dr. Doolittle, which was eh for me. Bowfinger, which is very eh. Nutty Professor 2. Then he has the hit. He has the successful Shrek. We're back to Dr. Doolittle with part two. Then we get the adventures of Pluto Nash. None Oof. of us want to talk about that. Oof. Oh boy. Man, not a good flick. Daddy Daycares in 2003. Dude, that film has some charm to it, but it, for me, the comedy in that film is so weak. Like it's so watered down. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah, he went through a string of not good movies uh, because uh, when did Metro happen? Metro was when? Metro was 90. Metro was. Still around 98. Because Nutty Professor was 90... 96. Um, so all that stuff, the, the, the stuff like, like Nutty Professor and the more like commercial stuff that started happening around 1999 or so. Uh, Shrek is like 2000, early 2000s. Metro was 97. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, that fits my point that he, it's like he went through all the string of hits all the way up to Nutty Professor. And like I said, with Beverly Hills Cop, he proved that he was a box office draw. And so they started giving this guy a lot of money. And so when you start giving somebody a lot of money, it doesn't really matter what's in these scripts. Sometimes these scripts are awful, but boy, mm-hmm. look how much money I got paid for it. Like he got paid a lot of money <laughs> for, I'm sh- like, just think of Mulan, for example, um, doing the voice of the Disney movie. Um, and just think of like how much money Shrek has made. Mm. Shrek has made just like ridiculous amounts of money. Yeah. Um, this guy got paid a lot of money to make some bad movies, man. <laughs> um, and that's what started happening to his, to his uh, filmography. wasn't It wasn't so mad, so much that he wasn't a successful draw anymore. It was just the studios knew, like, hey, you put Eddie Murphy in something, people will go see it. So let's mm-hmm. just pay this guy a ton of money and get him in and put him on the front of something like Holy Man. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor Doolittle, same thing. Doctor Doolittle isn't a terrible movie, but it's it. The entire appeal of watching this movie is seeing Eddie Murphy. And speaking of buddy cop action comedy films, in 2002, he does Showtime with Robert De Niro. This movie went nowhere, man. I actually think Showtime is very funny. Showtime Showtime is one of the Eddie Murphy movies that I defend, and I think it is very funny. Um, (laughs) His entire entire character that he wants to be an actor and not a police officer, and so the the whole catchphrase catchphrase for the show is um him turning to the camera and doing like the slow breaths. He's like <laughs> Showtime. <laughs> right. It's very funny. The way he plays off the Nero in that movie. No, it's it's very funny. Um him and him and a Wesley Snipes type? You picture him and a Wesley Snipes type? No, nah, we can get it done. <laughs> him? Yeah, that it I spy is another one. I spy is very funny to me. Him speaking in first person the entire movie. Um, Kelly Robinson, <laughs> his name, yeah. and he's like he's a boxer. He's basically Floyd Mayweather essentially. That's true. Um, and the entire movie he speaks in first person, and he has a scene kind of like this one where um, he gets arrested. He doesn't get thrown out of a window, but uh, he gets into a fight with Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson kicks him in the nuts. And the police come and immediately arrest him. And he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I being arrested? Why am I being arrested? My nuts were kicked. Why am I being arrested? <laughs> <laughs> he kicked me in the nuts and I'm getting arrested. What right. is this? Kelly Robinson doesn't get kicked in the nuts. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, he he's had some questionable uh, flicks. 
you and I have talked about Norbit. We've never covered Norbit. I don't think Norbit's as bad as what I've seen a lot of people say it is. Norbit is not a good movie, but Norbit is another one where I think Norbit is a lot funnier than it should be because of him. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, he was robbed of a he was robbed of an Oscar for for Dreamgirls, and I'll never stop saying that. Oh, he he sure. should have gotten an Oscar that year. Um, I thought he was also pretty funny in, in Tower Heist, even though Tower Heist is not a good movie. Mm-hmm. No, he has winners there, but it's just littered amongst a lot of other bad movies. Once he started going into the family movie thing and toned it down, then just not the same. It's not the same vibe anymore. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Meet Dave in 2008. Yeah, Meet Dave is another one. Not a good movie. Ooh, um, not good. Very silly premise to it. Uh, what's the name of the movie where he has the tree? And the, the the leaves are falling off of it, and the more leaves fall off of it, he's he's getting sicker and dying. Oh man, I don't know, but it sounds familiar. A thousand words. That's what it is. Is that the one? Jeez. Yeah, it's like the more he talks, every time he talks, a tree falls off, a, a leaf falls off the tree, and he's once all the leaves fall off, he's going to die. Oh wow. Co-produced by Nicolas Cage, released in theaters on March 9, twenty twelve. Wait a For- minute. <laughs> Wait a minute! Wait, I did not the... know. I did not know Nicolas Cage was attached to this movie. Oh yeah, co-producer. Wow. Yeah, you're gonna love this. This is okay. It it grossed twenty two million dollars worldwide on a budget of forty million. Oof. The guy that uh, directed it, Brian Robbins, it was the last movie he ever directed. Wow. <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a score of zero. Wow. I mean. You can't make this up. That is insane, man. It is a pretty bad movie. It It's not good. Yeah. I saw it on a plane. That's how I saw it. <laughs> There's Mr. Church in 2016, which is, oh my God. Um, the budget for Mr. Church was $8 million. It made $685,000. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, uh, yeah. There's mixed reviews, man. Um, yeah. Yeah, I uh, he made a he made a Dolomite movie somewhere around that time as well. I thought that one was at least received well because I thought people at least thought that was uh, funny. It was uh, entertaining. Twenty nineteen, yeah. Um, that one was at least received well, but yeah, he's had a he's had a string of not good movies, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not very good movies. Yeah, uh, the reviews for Dolomite were very very good, very good. Very like ninety seven percent. Wow! And man, it got nominated and it won some stuff. Wow! Did it win some stuff? Jeez! Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I have yet to check that out. Have you seen it? I don't think that I've seen all of it. Hmm. And you know what it is? I think it. I think it was one of those straight to Netflix things. And during yeah. the pandemic, and I didn't have Netflix anymore, so I never circled back to watch it. Hmm. Interesting. I might have to give it a chance because I've not watched it myself. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I love Eddie, man. I, I just, when he came back and did Saturday Night Live, it was classic. The moment he showed up, did his old bits again. I mean, and you know, there was, I don't know how he feels about it now, but I remember seeing an interview with him. This is, this is going back a couple, two, three years, I think, when they were talking about the possibility of him doing another stand-up because, you know, Seinfeld came back and other guys have come back to do a show. And his big thing was, is like, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but I think it had a lot to do with, I don't know how to follow that up. I don't know if I can do it anymore. I don't know if, what do I talk about? That kind of thing. Like, and I think you and I have, you and I have discussed here on the show before about, I'd love to see this guy on stage just absolutely yeah. crush it. I mean, dude. Yeah. What do you think about that, man? You th- uh, he could do it, right? Yeah, I would love to see him do a stand up again. I mean, for my money, he's he is one of the greatest comedians of all time. Like, yeah, well, I don't yeah. think that's even debatable. He's one of the greatest comedians of all time. Um, one of the most successful comedians um, on screen, and one of the most successful comedians when it comes to stand up. Um, I just, I don't, I don't think it's debatable. He, there are so many stand up comedians that came un- behind him that he opened the door to make money Mm -hmm. because he showed, he showed Hollywood that they could be leading men. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
And plus, he's done everything. He can do drama. He can do comedy. He can do action. He's just one of those guys. But but I'm with you. I Look, here's what I was going to throw at you about him coming back on stage. There's something to be said for I'm in my 20s versus I'm in my 50s. Like, the comedy is going to change. He's going to be talking about different things. I mean how much of that affects how he's received, how much, I don't know. Is he still, he's 62 now. You can't say he'd be cutting edge anymore. Is, is he still hip? Is he still cool? Is, I don't know the answers to these questions. I would think, yeah. Hey, Hey, Tom Clark here for Tom Clark's main event. And if you are not subscribed, you're doing life wrong. Going strong since 2014 with over 300 episodes and a variety of guests that include Randy Orton, The Big Show, Rob Van Dam, and a lot more. Check us out on all the major platforms, including YouTube at Boink Studios. Subscribe today, Tom Clark's main event. I don't know, dude. What if he did a special and it was poorly received? What if the jokes don't land? What if it doesn't? I don't know, man. It's the great unknown. Yeah, I just, I think the source material, or the content is going to be the thing that really drives it because stand-up comedy is just not what it was you know now it's just so heavily scrutinized i mean i'm not one of those guys that's like ah woke culture is ruining everything but um it's just so heavily scrutinized now that it's it's hard to imagine he could he could get away with something as edgy as raw today Mm. um and i i don't think he would want to try and get in that same bag but it did begs the question, what is he going to do? Um, and not to say that that stuff was only funny because he, uh, he, he was being edgy or he did things that were a little problematic, but I don't know. It's a good question of what does the Eddie Murphy stand up look like in, um, this era and at this age? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have the answer for that. I think that he can still be funny. I've seen him do interviews and he's still incredibly funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's done things in movies that were just like small bits like just me explaining this his character in, in Showtime and how I, I still thought it was very funny because it's Eddie Murphy and he's just a naturally funny man um, I think he can do a stand up and I think it can be successful but I don't know it's up to him and what he feels like he still has to say at this point as a stand up mm-hmm. yeah that's it exactly what have you got to say What what is it that you yeah yeah, you you know, again the fire, like the the, I don't know, dude. Uh, you know, especially for guys, I can't speak for women, but for guys, it's you're young, you can take on the world, you got angst, you might have a little anger, you got rebelliousness. You know, you'll say the things that older people won't say because they're too stiff. Like, but now he's that guy. So, yeah, I mean, he's never gonna top like his biggest moments in stand up. He's just sure. not going to. So those we've had too much time to live with those things. And so yeah. some of this stuff is still so quotable that no matter what he does in in comparison to those things it's always going to be less than. Yeah, for sure. I remember watching um I remember watching uh, uh Raw. It was on HBO and I was 15 and I was back home from abdominal surgery. I'd spent 2 weeks in the hospital. And I'm lying on the couch with incision, you know, in my stomach. All right. It's still, you know, fresh. Okay. And I'm at home recovering and I made the mistake of watching raw and I am trying to laugh and I can't because it hurts so bad. And I'm like wheezing, like I've got asthma and holding myself. And I'm thinking, just turn it off. What am I doing to myself? Just turn it off. And I didn't because I love the guys so much. And I was laughing or trying to laugh and in such pain because it was hilarious, man. Yeah. Raw. So good. So Jesus. good, man. Both both raw and delirious, man. Yeah. There's so many things from those standups that I quote regularly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's stuff that like just out of the blue, I just think uh, we're going to win this race. <laughs> Lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, uh, he says, oh, you just saw Rocky, huh? I love that. Oh. Listen, listen, tiny little white man. And he bends over as if the guy's that short and he's talking to him. 
Yeah, his, uh, that's again one of those things might not go over as well. His uh, his whole <laughs> impersonation of a uh, stereotypical Italian man after he saw yes. Rocky yes. is hilarious, but might not go over as well today. <laughs> Very funny though. Oh, so good, so good. He was talking about uh, being pulled over by gay police or something, and he's he says woo woo woo. And he says it's not a siren; it's a gay guy on top of the car going woo 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 like. <laughs> Shouldn't be laughing at that, but it's so funny the way he delivered it, man. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that stuff won't fly now, kids, unfortunately. Not that it should have flown then, but honestly, I don't recall any of that being out of hate or being out of anger. It was just jokes, man. I don't know. Not to get off on a should we or shouldn't we be funny anymore. Not for me to say. I mean, the climate is what it is, right? But hey. Yeah, it would definitely be a different show. Definitely be a different uh, it definitely be a different kind of presentation. So we know that he's doing Beverly Hills Cop Four. Is there any of his other franchises that he can wrap up? I mean, they never revisited Golden Child because it didn't make any money, of course. Even though I'm with you, I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. Yeah, I don't think you want to revisit Nutty Professor again. It's, it, they'll go back to the other guy. Another one. It, it's mm. all right. Let that one. Let that one stay. <laughs> where it was we don't need to revisit a uh, nutty professor again um i don't want to see another 48 hours either um, no yeah i think some of those franchises i don't think we needed another coming to america to be honest with you dude listen i thought i was the only dude only guy that believed that as well i did not see the need for that and i didn't hate the movie but i did not love it either yeah i don't know if i've ever seen it actually uh I'd tell you to watch it because you're a fan. I'd tell you to watch it, but I don't know if I don't know if you're going to come away from it going, "Oh, this is wonderful." I don't know. I don't know. It's not a terrible movie. It's just you know, eh, some of it doesn't work for me. Yeah, I, I'd love. I would love to have seen something back with Golden Child, but no, it's never going to happen. I mean, I can't think of anything else that that he did that they they could ever really go back to. I mean, the Shrek movies you can do till the end of time because it's just voice acting doesn't really matter. Yeah, there's really nothing else. That's really it. Uh, they redid, you know, they redid that Haunted Mansion flick recently. <laughs> and uh, I heard the critics were not nice to that film at all. Well. <laughs> so. And you don't want uh, Dr. Doolittle 3? No. I didn't want part <laughs> one. I, look, I get it. Look, as he got older and became a family guy, I get it. But like, eh. I'm not saying he has to be the dude in the purple suit on stage doing raw. I'm not saying that it's okay that he gets older, but like, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't know if I want that from him. I think I want, I don't know what I want, but I don't want that from him. You know, at this point he could be the Lieutenant behind the desk in a buddy cop movie and it may still work. You know what I mean? Yeah. First Dr. Doolittle has a really good soundtrack. Excellent. soundtrack. (laughs) I do not recall that soundtrack. Let's see here. Oh, wow. Timbaland's all over this thing. Jeez. Yeah. Excellent soundtrack. Yeah. There you go. Montel Jordan. Oh, man. Your, your favorite song of all time on there. Wait, this is how we do it on that soundtrack? <laughs> no. No, but the artist is. Oh, okay. I was about to say, wait. The song is Let's Ride. Oh, Remix. yes. I remember Let's Ride. Yeah. Well, kids, there you have it. There's Beverly Hills Cop 1. And if you think... If you listen, I know how the audience is. If you think for a second that you're going to get parts two and three just because we did part one, well, guess what? Guess what? You're probably right. You're probably right. It's fine because Eddie Murphy's effing great. He's still great. And uh, dude, does he? So, all right. So fans and comics and, and his peers still hold Richard Pryor in the highest of regard like they do Carlin. And they should. Both guys were effing amazing is eddie held to that high regard now or will he be do you think that he's achieved iconic status as richard Pryor did i think that he has Hmm. i mean for me at least i think that eddie has surpassed richard Pryor. that's just my opinion people won't don't necessarily have to agree but just for me and just for the for me and the time that i grew up in and the amount of time that he stayed on top i think eddie surpassed him Man, that's a hot take, buddy. It's a hot take. But it's fair because, listen, Richard couldn't keep himself clean. Like, he tried, but... Yeah, I don't even want to say it for that because I just mean... 
I mean, if if you're gonna argue me that Richard Pryor is a better stand up comedian than him, yeah, he probably is. But I mean, like in terms of like the amount of success that he has and had as an actor, the amount of other things that he did outside of stand up, mm-hmm. I I would argue that he surpassed him. Mm. He certainly is uh, an absolute legend. I don't know how anybody could consider him to be anything other than a legend. Hundred percent. The guy has done everything. The guy can do everything. I mean, you can cast him anything you want to cast him in. I'm not going to say it's a guaranteed hit because, as we've said, he's had some he's had some rough ones through the years. But you know, I think anything's possible in this day and age. Try something different. I don't know. Yeah, I'm curious what this. What do you think about this next 48 hours flick? What are you looking from it? What do you think it's going to be? Because I know nothing about this at all. Um, I know that they've been trying to make another Beverly Hills Cop for a long time. Um, at, at some point, um, they were going to try and do the spinoff as a TV show um, that tanked. Um, mm-hmm. I know that they had the guy from, um, they had the kid from uh, Tropic Thunder cast as the main um, star of it. And I, they shot a pilot for it and everything, and it just bombed. <laughs> oh, um, wow. I did not know that. Yeah, no, they've been trying to do more stuff with Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills Cop for a while, and it just hasn't worked. Um, and I know that they've been trying to get this movie made for a long time. Beverly Hills Cop Four, I feel like, has been in production for years. Like this goes back, I think, before even production for Coming to America Two started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Paramount Pictures. This is actually going to be a Netflix film. Did you know that? Uh, I didn't, but that makes sense. Yeah, I kind of hate that. I kind of hate that. I kind of really didn't want that. Yeah, you're right about the show. Brandon T. Jackson mm-hmm. was cast as Foley's son. The series was not picked up, but yeah, they moved ahead with a uh, with the fourth film. I mean, look, as long as it, as long as it, you know, as long as it gets what it needs, as long as they put a put a bow on the story, I mean, it it should be fine. I mean, it's, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, it sure seemed like they were trying to groom Brandon T. Jackson to be next up for a while. Yeah, they really did. I'm not sure I know what he what he's done since Tropic Thunder. I don't I don't know if I've seen uh, that terrible uh, Big Mama's House uh, sequel. Oh, God. Yeah, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> he's he's got a, a lot few... of credits, man. He's been in a few other things. He's been in uh, he was in that movie with Bow Wow where uh, Bow Wow won a lot of uh, uh, he was in the Percy Jackson movies. Mm-hmm. Roll Bounce. Roll Bounce is another one. Fast and Furious. He was in the Tooth Fairy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Tooth Fairy. He was in a movie in 2017 called Izzy Gets the F Across Town. What? Yeah, that's the name of it. <laughs> no idea what that is. Izzy Gets the F Across Town. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, hey, all right. Yeah, I don't think he's ever done anything. He actually, yeah, I don't think he's ever done anything that's that's come close to um, that's come close to uh, Tropic Thunder. I don't believe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm interested to see what happens. I, I'm going to definitely check it out uh, when it comes out. No matter what happens, Phil, you can't take away the success of this franchise, man. This first movie, I gushed by it like crazy when we started. I just think it holds up. I think it's great. I think this all-time classic. This needs to be in everyone's must-watch list. It needs to be. If you've got a top 50 or a top 100 and this movie isn't in it, there's something wrong. I know there's a lot of movies that been made over the years, but my God, this is a classic, man. I, I love this film to death. I don't know. What do you think, dude? Do you think part four is worth it? I mean, I mean, is the answer to that question, how good is the movie ultimately, or do you think it was worth any of that to begin with? I don't know. I, I immediately get reservations when something stayed in production um, purgatory for as long as this movie did. It takes mm-hmm. so long for it to get made because a lot of times when these things get made, they're never quite as good as you want them to be. And yeah. this is a franchise that got all the way up to a third movie that wasn't that great. Like it was funny for what it was, but we really need a fourth movie. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. Good call. That's a good question. I don't, Honestly, think we did, but hey, I suppose. Yeah, we'll see. I I don't know. I I feel like the guy's young enough where he can still do something good, and I think that uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a 
a buddy cop film or anything action oriented. It could be a drama, whatever. Um, the guy is super talented. So yeah, I'm always going to be a fan. I'm interested to see what happens with him next and if this movie is going to work or not. So we'll, we'll see. We'll find out together, kids. How about that? Phil, let's try to wrap this up, my friend. Give me your last word on Beverly Hills Cop. Iconic movie. Uh, easily one of the best and the most successful movies of Eddie Murphy's career. I think it still ages very well, despite it being very much a time capsule for that period in the 80s. Uh, still very funny. All of the music still hits. Um, the entire vibe of the mo- movie still hits for me. Um, I don't know. Still a very enjoyable movie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love this movie to death. I think it's so freaking good. Yeah, he's classic, man. I'm with you. I, I don't, I don't know if I can say he surpassed Pryor, but I, I don't know how when we when we write the book of of greatest comedians of all time, how Richard, how Eddie Murphy is. I mean, Eddie Murphy is obviously in that book, and I hope that he is. I mean, I hope he's getting his flowers now, not later, but get them now because he deserves it. I mean, he's the guy's classic, man. Just in every every way that counts, he's an absolute classic. Tour de Force, man, has made some great movies. Yeah. Has made some, some great stand ups, part of um one of the best sketch shows of all time. Has quietly made some some very good music as well. True. So, some of this music is not as good, but the guy has managed to make some hits. Tour de force, man. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I thought you were going to start mentioning that stuff he did with Rick James. I'm just saying. Yeah, man, party all the time is a classic. I just remember Rick James being really, really happy in the in the sound booth in the studio. <laughs> remember how happy he was? He was very happy. <laughs> he was very happy. Well, look, man, how many other comedians can you name that had a hit record with that was produced by by uh, Rick James? And had a feature from Michael Jackson. Okay, fine. Bruce Willis did one of those things, but not all three of them at the same time. He's a good man. <laughs> Eddie's, Eddie's a... And then came back and did some reggae music later in his career, man. He did, actually. I forgot all about the reggae stuff. So. Did all of the singing, and, and I believe he did most of the singing in Dreamgirls as well. Yeah, I think you're right about that. He was the Marvin Gaye archetype in that movie. He was. Um, he, he did like this kind of Marvin Gaye James Brown type ar- archetype. Cannot say enough how good he is in Dream Girls. He's excellent in that movie. Yeah. And he absolutely was robbed of that Oscar. If I have not already said that, I'm pretty sure I did. Best supporting actor, I believe he lost to Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin? I believe he lost to Alan Arkin for uh, Little Miss Sunshine. Wow. Yeah, you're right. Man, Mark Wahlberg was in that category and did not win for The Departed. Good, great movie. I just watched uh, Wolf of Wall Street this morning because I haven't seen it in a long time. Mm-hmm. Scorsese is one of those guys when you really think about some of the outlandish movies he's made for his career. Uh, he's made some very, very good movies. Wolf of Wall Street is a very good movie, but mm-hmm. <laughs> just when you really think about everything that happens in that movie, it's like, that. how is this possible that this movie was made? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Scorsese, like other people in Hollywood, have a problem with comic book films because people are threatened, I suppose, and they want to be making all that money. It's not cinema, man. Yeah, you're right. They're not actors. None of those people know how to act, I guess. It's not cinema. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio throwing a a little person at a dartboard is cinema, though. (laughs) Right. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, before we uh, before this becomes an entirely different podcast uh, based on Scorsese, Scorsese. <laughs> oh, it's so uh, it's musical that name. Yeah, I, I, it's a, if you don't know that, that's an Animaniacs reference. Ah, there you go. <laughs> they were aren't they bringing that back as well? Animaniacs. I think they already did, and I think they that's were right. only. Um, it was on one of the streaming platforms that it was exclusive to. I, I want to say it's Hulu. I might be wrong. See, they're Warner Brothers, so Warner that'd be Max, wouldn't it? Um, uh, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, Warner has not done bad with their exclusive uh, streaming stuff. Um, if you have not watched the new Superman cartoon on there, it's very good. I have it on my to watch list. I got the episodes added to my list. I haven't watched any of them yet. All right, kids. There you have it. There is Beverly Hills Cop. Be on the lookout. You may just be getting parts two and three here. We'll see. 
just keep your eyes and ears open. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with part four and Mr. Murphy in the days, weeks, months, years to come. Hopefully something awesome. But in the meantime, that is Beverly Hills Cop. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6M Podcast. We'll see you next time.